All right. Uh, so, any questions from yesterday? Any issues? Probably everyone feels pretty comfortable with the cardiac cycle and the difference of the action potentials between the pacemaker cells and and uh, you know the, those fast response cells. We normally see with a lot of the other the other myocytes. Remember the kind of the difference? Like, what, what's kind of the main driver for depolarization in like the pacemaker cells? Calcium. Yeah, calcium influx is a big one. Versus like say, the fast response cells, it's Sodium, right? And again, this will become important when we're talking about it in, in farms, especially when you get to the antiarrhythmic drugs, because a lot of them are working as like sodium channel blockers. A lot of them are calcium channel blockers and different things like that. So um, keeping that in mind for, for future courses is going to be important, because that's a lot of the ways we, we treat things like arrhythmias that, that occur. Anywho, um, so we're going to take the, the uh, information we took last time, talking about the, the cardiac cycle, kind of applying it to um, regulation of uh, blood pressure, cardiac output, and all of that. So we're going to get into details of that now. Why do we care about like managing blood pressure? Why is it important like, to know this stuff? Mm -hmm. That's how a person perfuses. Good, so you want to have blood pressure. That's important, right? What could happen if you have too much blood pressure, too high? You get a stroke. Kidneys can take a hit after, over time. What else? We will talk about some of these examples in just a little bit. So we'll show why it's so important. Uh, because this is a lot of your patients are going to be experiencing hypertension. Um, and it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a certainly a major driver for a lot of their disease states you're going to develop over time, right? This is a very chronic condition, um, and a lot of patients don't even know they have hypertension in cases because, again, do you feel when you have hypertension? Not usually. However, when it gets bad enough, if you start to feel it, then, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. But um, so we'll cover some of the things that kind of uh, dictate that. We'll talk about the different hormones um, that are going to be playing a role here and how we can regulate blood pressure and cardiac output. So anyway, say cardiac output, what does that mean? The output of the heart, yeah, absolutely, right? So just like you can imagine, it's the output that is coming from, from the heart there. And so it's going to be regulated by a couple of different things, right? And so again, when we're saying cardiac output, we're talking about the volume of blood that's being pumped out uh, from the ventricles each minute, right? And again, primarily we're talking about the left ventricle here, because right, the right ventricle is mainly supplying blood to where? To the lungs, right? Because again, it's carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get oxygenated, which we'll talk about in like section five of this, uh, or unit five of this section. Uh, however, the left ventricle is the main thing we're talking about here because that's supplying blood to the rest of the body. So anyway, cardiac output, usually defined as mLs per minute, is going to be basically equal. And I mentioned there's kind of two main determinants of cardiac output, and it's going to be our heart rate, which is usually beats per minute, right? Normal heart rate is like what? Like 60 to 80, yeah, somewhere around there. And again, it can be different for every patient depending on um, several factors, but there's a uh, you know, normal heart rate there and then uh, stroke volume, which is usually mLs per beat. Uh, and so we'll look at the different things that are going to play a role in determining what each of these uh, factors are going to be. We'll see with cardiac rate, we're going to see that, uh, you know, we talked about these a little bit already. We're going to see some of the major determinants are going to be things like the parasympathetic nerves, which usually do what to the heart rate? You should decrease it, right? What um, neurotransmitters affecting that? Acetylcholine on uh, what type of receptor? Muscarinic, right? So remember, muscarinic receptors, parasympathetic nervous system, that's going to be slowing down the heart rate typically. Sympathetic nerves, what uh, neurotransmitter are we looking at? <clears throat> Mainly norepi. Again, epi can have uh, the same, same role, uh, can play a very similar role on the heart rate. Um, so yeah, kind of think of those catecholamines kind of working pretty similar to one another. So epi, norepi, but when we're talking about sympathetic nerves uh, specifically here, norepi is going to be uh, released onto the heart. Um, and that will usually have what effect on heart rate? That was going to increase, right? And again, um, it's going to be norepi. Anyone remember what type of receptor it's going to be hitting? Beta 1. Beta 1 is the primary one. You'll have a little bit of beta 2 there, but beta 1 is going to be the uh, primary uh, driver of, of cardiac rate when you're talking about the sympathetic nervous system. So that's good. So we kind of know that. Um, then we're going to see with the stroke volume, we're going to find that this is going to be a um, basically going to be determined by the contraction strength. Anyone remember what we talked uh, what that term was? Inotropy, right? That's kind of the that contractility of the heart. It's how strong we're going to be squeezing there. And again, the sympathetic nerves play a big role there as well. Again, norepi is going to have a big uh, positive effect on contraction strength. Um, notice parasympathetic really have it has kind of a neutral response because again, the parasympathetic nerves weren't really directly innervating the ventricles so much. They were more just innervating things like the SA and the AV node, right? So um, not as much role in, in decreasing contractility, but certainly the sympathetic nerves are going to have a positive effect there, right? And then we're going to look at the end diastolic volume. Do you guys remember what that was? The volume at the end of that's it, right? So when the ventricles relax, how much blood is left over in that ventricle, right? And that's going to be playing a big role here. Has anyone ever heard of the Frank Starling law? 
We'll talk about that briefly and how that uh, has a direct effect on the contract utility string. Basically, what we're going to find is, is that as you increase the volume uh, left over at the end of diastole in the ventricle, that's going to cause stretch. And that stretch is going to say, hey, there's too much blood here. Let's go ahead and increase the contractility strength so that way we can get more blood out. And that will have a positive effect on, on stroke volume as we're going to see here. Okay. The other thing uh, that's going to determine stroke volume is basically going to be the the uh, the resistance or what the blood uh, the ventricle is basically pumping against essentially, right? And so this is where we're going to look at mean arterial pressure. Remember how we calculated that? One third, One -third systolic plus two thirds your diastolic. Good. Yeah. So basically, that mean arterial pressure is basically going to be what we're trying to pump against essentially, right? So the higher this goes, what do you think it's going to do to your stroke volume? So if I have a higher pressure, if I put, say, you know, like if you ever like put a kink in a hose, what happens to the flow? It, yeah, it starts to slow down, right? So again, the more pressure you're going to be putting on that hose, mainly we're looking at places like the, or the arteries and we're looking at the, the aorta, the more pressure that's there, the more uh, resistance to flow there's going to be. Stroke volume tends to go down in that case, right? So again, just like you're putting like a clamp on a hose or something or putting your uh, putting a kink in there, it's going to impede flow essentially, right? So that's going to be a real big thing. We're talking about blood pressure and why we see some of the changes that we see in chronic diseases like uh, congestive heart failure and, and, and all that, mainly is due to too much pressure in the, in the arterial system. Anyway. So again, um, when we're looking at um, the cardiac rate, again, positive chronotropic effects, which chronotropy is just what? It, well, speed so much in like actual heart rate, right? So you're not necessarily like speed of conduction because remember what that was called? You, I mean, that's right, yes, speed, <laughs> heart rate, essentially. I didn't mean to say you were wrong, but I just, I want to be uh, more clear, I guess. So again, uh, the speed of conduction, we talk, uh, talked about that as being what? Uh, that term? Uh, dromotropy, remember, it's, like, it's actual speed of conduction is that dromotropy, but chronotropy here is what we're talking about as far as heart rate goes. Um, again, positive chronotropes are going to have an increase in cardiac rate, negative chronotropes. Uh, you'll, you'll hear us talking about that when we're talking about, you know, different treatments and things like that. When we're talking, and, and someone mentioned the drug dobutamine last time. That was a, was a beta-1 agonist, so we know if it's going to be acting at the beta-1 receptor, um, that will work to do what to the heart rate? Should increase it, which you'd call that a positive chronotrope, right? So again, that would be something that would increase the heart rate. So again, these terms do come up. We talk about negative versus positive uh, chronotropes, and then we'll also talk about inotropes as well being really important, so positive or negative inotropes. So again, looking at the sympathetic nerve effects on the SA node, we should see increased rate of, of depolarization. We see increased cardiac rate, which we know. AV node should see an increased conduction rate as well. And then with the atrial muscle and the ventricular muscle, you should see an increase in contractility. So in this case, norepinephrine coming from the sympathetic nerve should be a positive uh, chronotrope and also a positive inotrope. Okay. On the other hand, with the parasympathetic nerves, you're going to see that usually acetylcholine working on those muscarinic receptors is typically a negative chronotrope. However, you don't really see it working really as a negative inotrope. It doesn't really have any negative effects on the contractility, so to speak, because again, those nerves really just don't, don't innervate that, that muscle, uh, that, you know, the ventricle uh, tissue there, or the atrial tissue for that matter. So again, a um, little bit of a distinction there to know between the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system and what their effects on the heart specifically are. Okay, so um, that was cardiac rate. Uh, looking at actual stroke volume, we're going to see there's uh, a couple of different variables that are going to be influencing this, which you can kind of see here. Um, so again, stroke volume is going to be determined by contractility, our uh, preload, and then also our afterload. Okay, so this little cartoon kind of helps to uh, illustrate this. But basically, um, preload, anyone know what preload is? Hand to guess. Yes, it's going to be in diastolic volume, but... This is going to be what we're, because again, when I ask these questions, it may seem like I'm like, a, that seems pretty odd, in diastolic volume. But the, the reason why I ask these questions is because when you're explaining to a patient, they're going to be like, well, what the heck does in diastolic volume mean? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Basically, I try to explain it and I try to kind of help you guys along to try to help learn to explain things to people who have really not a lot of medical knowledge. Because again, education is going to be nine tenths of your job in a lot of cases, uh, trying to help people to understand why you're doing what you're doing, essentially. Um, but with the end diastolic volume, essentially, that's what we're supplying to the heart. This is going to be mainly determined by things like venous return coming back to the heart. So what are we loading up the heart with, the preload, what are we kind of loading it up with to get ready for that contractility, to get ready for that contraction to eject the blood out, essentially, right? So again, the more venous return we have, the more preload we're going to have, the more volume that that heart has to uh, contract against, right, to, to eject out of the, the ventricle there. Um, Typically, as you increase the end-diastolic volume, stroke volume should go up as well. We'll talk about why that is, uh, Frank Starling Law, just a few minutes here. Um, but again, end-diastolic volume, that is preload. The more blood I'm supplying back to the heart through the venous system, the more um, stroke volume I should have to, to counteract that, right? 
Okay. Next thing is going to be contractility or the inotropy again. Uh, this is going to be the strength of the ventricular contraction. Typically, as you uh, increase contractility, stroke volume should go up as well, right? So if I'm increasing how hard I'm squeezing, I should increase the stroke volume as well. So I have a positive effect on that. And then finally, we're talking about the afterload, which is going to be our total peripheral resistance. And we can guess what that is. Yeah, basically that mean arterial pressure. It's going to be basically the impedance or the, the resistance you have uh, of uh, preventing that blood from flowing out of the ventricle, right? Because again, this is all based on pressure differentials. When we're uh, having a contraction, we're having systole in the ventricle. That's what uh, we're trying to overcome that pressure in the aorta to pump the blood out, essentially, right? That's what's opening up those semilunar valves. And so, again, when you're looking at... Um, Okay, this picture here, you can kind of see a little clamp on the aorta, essentially, uh, that is preventing that flow, and that's considered the afterload. So in this case, if I have an increased afterload, what do you think that's going to do to stroke volume? Should decrease it, right? Good. If I have decreased uh, total peripheral resistance, if I decrease the afterload, that should do what to the stroke volume? go up right good um this is important because if you consider someone who has a really chronic hypertension their blood pressure is chronically high you're kind of chronically impeding the blood flow coming out of the ventricle what does muscle do when you're trying to when you strain it it tends to get bigger right it tends to hypertrophy right so this is the same thing that happens to the left ventricle it's a muscle like anything else and so it tends to hypertrophy now having a big heart you know sometimes you say it's a positive thing like you have a really big heart um Sometimes you say you have no heart, but a really big heart, is that usually a good thing for a patient from a medical sense? Not necessarily. It's cardiomyopathy. It's not great because uh, you're going to find that the heart becomes less efficient at pumping blood. The bigger it gets because it gets more fibrous and it gets less uh, less pliable. You're going to find there's lots of problems with that. So again, this is going to be a big issue uh, with these kind of chronic hypertensive patients. This is how you start to develop things like congestive heart failure. Okay. So anyway, so these are um, important distinctions here. Total peripheral resistance has an inverse effect on stroke volume. However, contractility and preload tend to have a, uh, a proportional uh, response there. So as you increase both of those, they should increase stroke volume as well. Okay. So now we kind of know what's playing a role both in, in changing the heart rate and then also what's actually changing the stroke volume. And by combining those two together, you should be getting your, your cardiac output, right? Just time one versus the other. So that way I can uh, multiply how frequently the heart's contracting with how much it's actually sending out each with each uh, with each contraction. That should give me my cardiac output in ml's per minute, essentially. Okay. Uh, so uh, when looking at the things that will affect the preload, uh, what do you think might affect preload? How much uh, blood's coming back to the heart? Hmm? Yeah, so if I'm increasing venous return, if I'm increasing the amount of blood I have, essentially, or if I increase blood volume, that could be a big thing, right? So if you imagine someone has, uh, say, uh, too much volume, what do you call that? Hypervolume, yeah, that can be a case where actually are increasing in diastolic volume because they have much more blood kind of coming back to the venous side. That's an important thing. You start to have patients who have a lot of like edema and kind of fluid backup. Again, that's another problem that you see with these um, CHF patients that are building up fluids and stores over time because, again, um, they're hypervolemic in, in a lot of cases. Um, so again, this is going to be big things we're going to focus on. And in fact, when we're talking about treating hypertension or treating things like CHF, um, we're going to look at things that both affect the preload and also things that affect the afterload. So these are important considerations here. This will come up again and again. So having a good understanding now is going to be the basis for CMS and, and farm mills and other things later on. Okay, so just another um, picture kind of showing uh, kind of the same thing we were talking about already, but again, looking at stroke volume, typically when you're increasing the preload, this should have a positive effect on it, in, or it should increase the end stock volume. It should increase the stroke volume. In these cases here, we mentioned in systolic volume. What is that? So how much blood is left over at the uh, end of the systole, right? So again, you're, you're not injecting 100% of that blood out. You're going to have a little bit left over. What you're going to find is that typically when you're increasing inotropy or increasing that contractility strength, that should do what to your in systolic volume? Should decrease it, right? So I'm pumping more, a bigger fraction of that blood out of the ventricle. So that should have a negative effect here. And so as you decrease in systolic volume, so as the value, uh, value increases, you're going to find that stroke volume is going to go down, right? So again, this could be a sign where if in stroke volume or in systolic volume is higher, that means that maybe the heart's not being as efficient to actually getting rid of some of that blood in those cases there. So for instance, if I have someone who has a, a poor heart, the left ventricle is not working very well, and they may have a hard time contracting very efficiently to get that blood out, what do you think happens to your stroke volume? going to go down, right, because they're just not beating as efficiently there. That's when you start to see the things like changes in people's ejection fraction or how much they're actually ejecting out of the heart in each beat. Um, so that can be an issue there. So again, in systolic volume, or as that goes up, you tend to see this kind of a, a negative uh, effect on the stroke volume there, okay? Um, looking at afterload, which again is going to be that pressure that we're pumping against, as that increases, what do you think it's going to do in systolic volume? Some more pressure pushing against the ventricle. 
it's going to increase that, right? Because again, I'm having a harder time pumping that blood out. So again, this would have a positive effect on end systolic volume. That again will have a negative effect on stroke volume total. Okay, make sense? Okay. Same thing you can kind of see here. This kind of shows you if I increase preload, that should increase stroke volume, but it will also increase my end diastolic volume. If I'm increasing afterload, that should decrease stroke volume because my end systolic volume is going up. And then if I'm increasing contractility, that should also increase my stroke volume because my end systolic volume is going down. Okay. Your stroke volume is just going to be your uh, end diastolic minus your end systolic, right? All right. So uh, looking at that Frank Starling law, uh, how we are going to uh, kind of change changes in end diastolic volume, how that has an effect on contractility. Um, you'll see here that uh, basically if you're looking at stroke volume in mLs and you're looking at ventricular end diastolic volume, right? You're going to see here that as the end diastolic volume increases, you're going to see that's going to start to cause the stroke volume to go up as a proportional amount. Because again, you don't want a lot of that blood left over. Your heart wants to respond to that. So it has stretch receptors in the ventricles that can determine that and say, okay, well, I have all this extra blood left over, this extra pressure. Let me go ahead and increase the contractility to try to increase my stroke volume. Okay. And so what do you think that does to the workload of the heart? It's also going to increase the, the workload there. So the problem is, um, and that also does what to oxygen consumption? It's going to increase oxygen consumption. You can see how these patients have issues to where over time they're chronically kind of um, got too much afterload. They're chronically having high pressure they're pumping against, and now they're uh, having increased preload, all the extra volume coming in. The ventricles are working way, way harder than they really need to in those cases. Uh, and then that's why you see all these changes that occur, these negative changes, that's why you see CHF develop over time. So you can start to see how this is already occurring. And again, uh, what happens if I stop delivering oxygen to the heart? What do you call that? Myocardial ischemia, right? So again, that's bad. And this is how you can preempt uh, some of these these MIs is by having a heart that is requiring a lot more oxygen than normal, and if you're impeding that blood flow due to other things like plaques or something, um, that's where you have an MI develop. Okay. So anyway, so just again, you can see how some of these things are going to be playing a role in the future. All right. So again, just another picture, uh, kind of reiterating the points here. The cardiac output is a product of the cardiac rate and the stroke volume, and have a good understanding of what changes this is going to have, uh, these different uh, variables here. So if I were to ask you on a test, for instance, if I were to say um, I have increased sympathetic activation, say, for instance, you would find that, uh, uh, say, an alligator popped out of the water you're walking by, and then all of a sudden you hit your sympathetic nerve starting to, to fire off, what effects would that have on stroke volume? Should increase, right? What effect would that have on cardiac output? Should increase. What effect would that have on cardiac rate? Increase, right? So these are things you want to have a good understanding of because, again, when we try to modify these things, either with drugs or other things, um, you're going to find you need to have a good understanding of what the normal physiology is to understand how we're going to be changing things, what effects that should have overall. Okay? These are good things to know. Everyone with me so far? All right, so we mentioned venous return, uh, the end diastolic volume mainly going to be controlled by things like total blood volume uh, and also the venous pressure. Now, are the veins normally a really high pressure sort of system? No, right? So again, compared to the arteries, they're pretty low pressure for the most part, which is good because we don't need a lot of pressure on that side. Um, and you're going to find that they, we call these capacitance vessels, which means they can hold a lot more volume than your arteries typically can. They're a lot more compliant. They can have a lot more stretch associated with them. So basically, like about two thirds of your blood volume should be in the venous side of things um, at any given time, right? It's a very low pressure system. That's also how you can have the things like, you know, anyone ever a uh, deep venous thrombosis? I'm familiar with that term. So we have a clot that develops like somewhere in the leg or something after like a long plane flight or something like that. Because that's a low flow system, it's a low pressure system, you can find cases where blood on uh, the venous side will start to kind of sludge up a little bit. So imagine if you're like on a plane for 12 hours or something, you have really poor circulation. Um, that's where you can have the blood start to uh, kind of sludge up and it kind of like hangs out one spot and then it can potentially clot. And that's how you can see things like DVTs develop. So it kind of helps me to remember that, you know, the veins are low, low uh, pressure sort of system there. Um, a lot of blood's going to be hanging out there because because it's such a high capacitance sort of vessel. But uh, again, as we have a higher amount of volume hanging out in the venous system, that means we're gonna have more blood returning back to the heart, which you know that's gonna increase our end diastolic volume that increases our preload essentially. Uh, other things you can find is that um, as far as the venous return goes, uh, looking at things like uh, venoconstriction, Right. So again, there's uh, there's vasoconstriction, which kind of refers to both arterial constriction and, and venoconstriction. But when we're specifically looking at venoconstriction, which can occur due to the sympathetic activation, you're going to find this is going to increase that venous pressure. And that should do what to the venous return to the heart? Yeah, it should increase it. So as you increase venous pressure, that should increase the amount of blood flow getting back to the heart. It should increase in diastolic volume. should increase that, that preload there. Also, skeletal muscle, like just uh, by passively or... Uh, 
by actively using your muscles, that also increases the uh, venous return as well. Because again, you're just uh, kind of putting extra pressure on those on those veins and kind of uh, increasing the pressure there. So that should increase venous return. Even breathing can have a, a positive effect on increasing venous return here. And then we're also looking at things like blood volume, right? Um, now, as in regards to blood volume, how do you think we could um, change blood volume? Like a drink stuff, like I could just drink a liter of water, right? And that increases blood volume. All that should get absorbed, okay? Well, how do I get rid of water? I could, I could pee it off, right? I can turn it into urine, essentially, right? So again, this is a big thing where you can modify this quite frequently in patients. So for instance, if I have someone who has uh, a problem with preload, they have too much blood volume, they have too much, you know, uh, they're, they're hypervolemic, I can do things like increasing their urine volume. Anyone heard the term diuretic before? Yeah, most of you are probably consuming a diuretic. Anyone know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. Caffeine, yeah, caffeine's a, a mild diuretic. You can find that that will decrease the uh, blood volume because you're increasing the amount of urine you're actually producing, right? You're increasing your blood volume right now. I can tell that big gallon of water right there. I'm assuming it's water. Could be anything. We'll just go with that. Um, straight back. Start the day off right. Right, comrade? Anyway. Yeah. So um, if that's what you need to get through my lecture, that's what you need. Right? That's why I record them all so I can go back later. Anyway. Um, but also think, look at uh, tissue fluid volume as well. So if you were to have, say, like um, uh, volume that was, uh, say, exiting the intravascular space, say you had like third spacing of fluids, we call that, where you have, for instance, um, you know, ascites, where you have a lot of fluid kind of building up in the, in the abdominal area. If you have, um, you know, a lot of like pitting edema out, let's say, in the peripheral, uh, you know, in your extremities, um, those are things that also have a negative effect on blood volume because if the volume is not there in the, in the vessels, then they're going to be out somewhere else, essentially, right? So that's, that's one thing you can see. Um, but the main thing we can do is kind of modify the urine volume that we're producing that can change blood volume pretty significantly there. So usually more urine means you're going to have less blood volume, essentially. Okay. Then again, just look at the distribution of blood at rest. And normally this is going to change over time, as you'll see, because again, um, the body can, can shunt blood to different areas based on kind of what's going on. We'll see some different cases where we can do that, whether we're at rest or we're exercising, et cetera. Because um, again, we want to make sure we're pumping blood to the right places, you know, whatever is, is most active at those points. Again, most of the blood, though, should be kind of hanging out in some large veins, small veins and venules. Uh, again, two-thirds of our flow of your blood should be in the venous side at any given time there. Okay, so looking at blood volume. So looking at the role of the sympathetic nervous system, so there's a lot of ways we can modify um, our blood volume. Um, you're going to find that a couple of different organs are going to be really responsible for this. So what organs might you expect? The kidneys are going to be big, right, because, again, kidneys what produce urine. We're also going to see a lot of hormonal effects are going to affect the kidneys. We're also going to find that the heart is actually going to be uh, one of the um, places where we're seeing another sort of uh, hormone get released from, from the atria specifically, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but having a good understanding of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, having a good understanding of uh, ADH, right, antidiuretic hormone, having a good understanding of this atrial natriuretic peptide are all going to be really good. Under now, you need to have that understanding to kind of understand what's going on. We have a patient who say increased blood volume or decreased blood volume, what changes occur and what effect that's going to have on things like blood pressure, what changes it's going to have on things like um, you know, kidney blood flow, et cetera. So we'll talk about all these hormones here in just a few minutes um, in more detail, but we're going to go over all of these um, in, in specific detail. Again, this is a big thing you're going to find, especially when we talk about management of CHF or management of patients after MI, uh, hypertension. Um, this is a big system we're going to be targeting here because we're going to see if this has a pretty big ramifications, especially on the chronic um, sort of time scale there. Okay. So anyway, so one of the things we'll see um, with the sympathetic nervous system is that usually increased blood volume in the atria. Having that increased blood volume in the atria, what do you think it's going to do to stretch receptors? Should, yeah, it should trigger them. It should be activated. It should say, hey, okay, there's too much stretch that's happening here. Um, and again, we always want to maintain homeostasis. So you're going to see there's a lot of negative feedback loops that are occurring here to make sure we're kind of keeping everything in check uh, for the most part. Now, what you're going to find with the atria, uh, by stimulated by those stretch receptors, it's going to lead to increased sympathetic activation. Okay, so that's one way you can actually trigger that uh, sympathetic activation, um, especially to the heart. Because again, if it has increased blood volume, what do you think it's going to, the heart's going to want to do with that extra volume? get rid of it, right? So we want to pump it out. So that's why we're going to be increasing things like sympathetic activation. We know that it has positive effects on stroke volume, on cardiac rate. Um, and then what you're going to find also um, uh, will decrease stimulation to places like the kidneys. It's one of those things we can have um, to try to retain blood volume in some cases. So again, we'll go in more detail these in just a few minutes, but just know that atria is going to be a big place that's going to help to regulate uh, blood volume in a lot of cases. Uh, we're going to find that the kidney arterioles can do things like dilate uh, to help to increase blood flow uh, going to that, um, and also can do things like increase urine production in these cases. So 
what you'll find in these cases when you have the atria stretching is since too much volume. So, okay, well, let's get the heart to get rid of the blood to pump it out, but then we also want to make more urine in order to get rid of that volume there as well. So it can do things like uh, preferentially send blood flow to the kidney specifically to make more urine because the more you filter, essentially, the more you're going to be able to produce urine, and then you can get rid of that, right? You know what you call that when you uh, increase urine production? Diuresis, right? You just mentioned diuretic, so again, diuresis will be the term we're going to use for that. Um, that should have a negative effect on blood volume, and that should have a negative effect on blood. So volume's going down, pressure should also go down as well. And then what do you think that happens to the atria at that point? It's not getting stretched out so much, right? So then now the stretch goes down, now the atria doesn't have to be triggered in that same way, so now the sympathetic activation will then start to go back down as well, okay? So again, this is all negative feedback loop we're going to see here. Um, we're going to get into more detail on the specific hormones here in just a minute, moment. Looking at antidiuretic hormone, we've talked about this before, but we can kind of see um, more specifically how this is going to be affecting our blood volume. Um, again, with antidiuretic hormone, you would think that normally does what to blood volume? Should increase, right? And how is it going to do that? Reabsorbing sodium. So the main thing it's going to do is really focus on reabsorbing water more so than, than so. You're going to see a little bit of sodium increase in reabsorption, but usually it's because mainly the sodium is following the water. The main thing with antidiuretic hormone you're going to see is going to be pumping or putting these aquaporin channels, and we'll talk about this more specifically in the kidneys later on. Um, they're putting these aquaporin channels that are very good at reabsorbing water in the collecting ducts. Uh, within the kidneys, right? So again, typically when you have increased antidiuretic hormone being released there, um, you should have uh, less urine production potential, or the urine that you're producing should be more concentrated or more dilute? Concentrated. More concentrated, right? Because I'm absorbing more of that water, right? Okay, so that should increase blood volume, right? What are some other ways that antidiuretic hormone can affect blood volume? It's going to cause some vasoconstriction, absolutely. So you're going to see some increase in pressure uh, that can occur with that. But not, that doesn't really specifically affect the blood volume so much. Um, it definitely does cause uh, some vasoconstriction. But what does it do? Um, what does it kind of stimulate sort of centrally? Thirst, right? So again, it also will stimulate me to actually drink more water, to drink something, um, to increase blood volume that way as well. Because again, what are the things that trigger ADH release? Yeah. So yeah, so osmolality is a big thing, right? So again, if your blood's too concentrated which is a sign of dehydration, the osmolality is too high, that is what is the big trigger there, right? So low blood volume and then the high osmolarity of the, the blood is going to be what triggers the ADH to be released there, right? So again, either of those cases occur, ADH will be released, you should see more water reabsorption from the kidneys, which then will make the urine more dilute, or I'm sorry, more uh, concentrated so that your blood can become more diluted in those cases, right? Osmolarity should be around what? Yeah, 280, 300, somewhere around there, right? So milliosmoles per liter should be around uh, that, that level. And so these are going to be the big things you're going to see. Uh, the ADH is going to have a big role here, right? So another nerd term for this is vasopressin. Remember, this is actually a drug we'll give if we have patients who are um, severely hypotensive, uh, especially if they're really critically ill in the ICU and they're hypotensive and we have them on things like uh, norepinephrine drip. We'll also put them on a vasopressin drip as well because not only is it going to help them to increase that blood volume to try to get their pressure back up, but it also can help the vasoconstrict as well. So it's uh, kind of an add-on. We call that a vasopressor. If you ever hear of a drug that increases blood pressure, it's called a vasopressor essentially, right, because it's going to help to increase that constriction, as we'll see. So those are the big things with ADH, and remember how that's going to have a role here, right? So again, remember uh, also if I decrease ADH release, what do you think that's going to do to blood volume? Should go down, right, because if the, uh, say for instance, the hypothalamus detects that the blood is too dilute, the osmolality is too low, and that should decrease ADH release, what do you think it's going to do to uh, urine? You may see increase in urine, and also the urine is going to be more concentrated or dilute? More dilute, right? So again, they have kind of a balancing act there. So as I'm trying to um, concentrate the blood, I'm going to be making the, the urine more dilute. And these are cases where you can actually do a urinalysis and determine things like specific gravity uh, in order to determine just how dilute or concentrated it's going to be. Uh, it, can, it can give you a clue as to what's going on with the patient, essentially, right? All right, so I think we talked about that. Uh, this is basically going to be the other side of this. Um, the other thing to note here um, is that as the blood becomes dilute, you know, we said ADH release is going to be inhibited. At that point, again, that's a negative feedback loop. Um, as we mentioned with the, the atria and the stretch receptors there, um, you can also find this in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. Um, as you find that these end up becoming stretched, you also find this will inhibit ADH release, okay? And that kind of makes sense because if I'm stretching these out because there's too much blood volume, do I need ADH release? No, the ADH normally increases blood volume in those cases. So you can find there's kind of multiple sort of things that can feed back and inhibit the system here. So again, it's not just the fact you're detecting osmolarity, but you can have other inputs into the system. You can have other things like this atrial stretch receptors. If those are not, or those are being act too active, uh, showing there's too much blood volume, too much stretch, that can then feed back and decrease ADH release as well. So just know there's kind of multiple things that can feed into the system here. Um, 
as I mentioned as well, stretch receptors in the atria is going to release a, a hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide. Anyone know what uh, natriuresis means? Yeah, so it's basically going to pee out sodium, essentially. So it's the natriuretic basically means you're just peeing out sodium. So I just think of the uri, I think, uh, you know, urine, I think uh, Na, I think sodium. So that's how I can remember that. So natriuretic, uh, so atrial natriuretic peptide should do what to sodium? Should decrease it because um, where's it going? It's going in the urine. I'm peeing it out, basically, right? Um, so again, that's going to have what effect on blood volume? Because remember, wherever salt goes, water wants to follow it typically, right? So again, if I'm peeing out a bunch of salt, water's going to want to go with it, and that blood volume should then go down in those cases, right? Okay. So now we see uh, kind of two big uh, effects here. So again, if I have um, osmolality can affect, uh, my blood volume can affect, uh, you know, ADH release. We're going to see that the stretch in the, in the aorta can be a big thing here that can affect atrial natriuretic peptide. Typically, if those are being stretched and you're releasing ANP, that should cause you to lose more urine. There's blood volume that should cause those uh, stretch to go down. And then once the stretch receptors aren't being uh, triggered anymore, then AMP should uh, go down as well. And that should kind of regulate the blood volume. Make sense? So again, if I were to ask a question, for instance, on a test, uh, and again, I haven't written this one yet, but or I haven't gone through and reviewed it yet, but um, if I were to write a question that says, like, hey, you have this patient who has hypervolemia, Right. And I may ask you, okay, well, what, um, which hormones do you think would be increased, decreased, or stay the same? Um, and I can say things like atrial natriuretic peptide. You know, said hypervolemia, what would you expect their AMP to be? Be increased, right? Because again, as you increase blood volume, they're hypervolemic. That should be stretching the atria. That should be increasing release of AMP, right? Versus if I said someone's like, say, hypovolemic, you said AMP would be, be decreased in those cases. The atria should be getting stretched at that point, right? So these are things you want to uh, think through and kind of understand all the, the, the negative feedback loops and kind of know from step to step what should be changing in all these situations. Yes, ma'am. From the heart, or is it from the atria? From the atria. Yeah, specifically. Yeah, yeah. so that'll be uh, released from there. And actually, um, this is another one you'll see. Uh, there's also a, a beta natriuretic peptide um, that is also going to be uh, uh, related back to things like atrial stretch and whatnot. And this is a big thing you're going to be measuring in patients with, with CHF. And so, again, CHF patients typically have a lot of fluid overload. And so, that again can feed back into that, that atrial stretch you can measure. And, and if you can measure those levels and they're high, then that shows you, yes, they have high blood volume. Yes, they are trying to release this in order to try to get rid of some of that, that um, salt and try to get some of that water within the kidneys, right? So. Okay. So again, looking at ADH, specifically again, dehydration, decreased blood volume. Um, you know, if you were to have increased salt ingestion, because what, what is that going to do to plasma osmolarity? Or just like eat a bunch of salt tablets or something? Should increase the blood osmolality, right? So again, it should be increased. That is going to cause the osmoreceptors there in the hypothalamus to be triggered. It should be increasing uh, thirst response. It should be increasing the drinking of water to try to help dilute that down. Um, should also be increasing the ADH release there. We're going to see more water retention by the kidneys. And then as the blood volume goes up, blood osmolality goes down. That's then going to feed back and shut down the ADH release at that point. Okay, so just remember that. Okay, uh, another hormone that's going to be important here. Remember aldosterone? Where is that getting released from? Adrenal cortex, right? So that's a big, um, big player here in this system as well. So what does aldosterone do as far as, what do you think it's going to do to blood volume? It's going to increase. Remember uh, the term I used for, kind of the umbrella term I used for aldosterone? We had glucocorticoids for things like cortisol. Yeah, mineralic corticoids, right? So again, <laughs> mineralic corticoids are going to be things, that I think mineral, things salt, things are going to hold on to salt. When I hold on to salt, it's also going to hold on to water. Wherever salt goes, water goes too. So this is going to be an important thing here. Uh, and remember, if we're holding on to salt and water due to aldosterone, what are we losing in that process? Potassium is going to be a big thing we're going to be seeing. We're losing that case, right? So again, aldosterone is going to be secreted from the adrenal cortex, usually going to be in response to things um, like increases of this hormone called angiotensin II. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. Has anyone ever heard of like an angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitor or like an ACE inhibitor? This is where these are going to be playing a role here. So when we talk about angiotensin II, this is a big player, but we'll get to that in a second. Basically, though, this is going to trigger the, uh, the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, and so this causes an increase in water reabsorption. So when I do that, it does what to blood volume? Typically goes up. Um, I'm going to be holding on to more salt, uh, but I should be losing potassium. So in some cases, when you have patients have hyperaldosteronism, you should expect them to see maybe like mild hypernatremia, but also hypokalemia can also be seen there as well, right? So again, you can sometimes see that uh, with, with even patients who have kind of uh, kind of 
high aldosterone level just due to other disease processes essentially but um, those are big things there and then again as you were to have say blood volume go up and say you were to have a decrease in the amounts of angiotensin 2 that's being released at that point then you should see that uh, blood volume should start to kind of regulate uh, it should start to to go back down essentially or kind of um, as you decrease aldosterone uh, release you should start to see more of that salt and water being eliminated in the urine at that point okay so again all of these work on negative feedback loops essentially okay and again, normally you're going to find that aldosterone doesn't have a big effect on blood osmolality because, again, you're absorbing salt and water basically at a, at a pretty um, commensurate, uh, commensurate amount. And so because of that, you don't really see any big changes there. However, with like um, ADH, though, notice we're only mainly increasing release or increasing reabsorption of what? Just water, right? So again, that's why it has a much bigger effect on plasma osmolality than aldosterone does, because aldosterone is still getting some of that salt in there. You may get like a little bit of uh, sodium kind of coming, uh, increase in reabsorption with, with ADH, but it's not nearly as much as the water is going to be reabsorbed in those cases there. Okay. So this is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So if you ever hear like the RAS system, that's what we're referring to here. And this is a big, big player when you're dealing with patients with hypertension. Um, so when blood pressure is low, Mainly we're going to find, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the kidneys, uh, I think in the next section, but basically you have these uh, cells called the juxtaglomerular cells. Anyone know what juxtaglomerular means? Next to the glomerulus, absolutely. So in just a glomerular apparatus, there's these cells here that can detect things like blood pressure, blood volume. And so when it detects the blood volume is low, it's going to increase in the release of this enzyme called renin, right? So renin gets released from the kidneys, okay? Renin and then is going to be... Um, basically is going to convert this precursor molecule called angiotensinogen. It gets converted over to angiotensin 1 by renin, okay? So renin release increases the amount of angiotensin 1 I'm producing, and then we're going to find that there's going to be an angiotensin converting enzyme, or this ACE enzyme, that is then going to convert angiotensin 1 over into angiotensin 2, okay? So if renin is increasing in release due to low blood volume detected by the kidneys, then this is going to increase the amount of angiotensin 2 we have, okay? Angiotensin 2 is the main one we really care about in this case and where we're actually most of our drugs and things like that can affect it. Uh, but we're going to find that uh, angiotensin 2 is going to be a very potent vasoconstrictor. So it should cause hypertension. It should cause your, say, your afterload to do what? Should increase, right? Because remember that afterload is that pressure that the ventricles are pumping against. So again, if I were to have an increased amount of angiotensin 2 being produced in the body, and we should expect that vasoconstriction to occur, total peripheral resistance should go up. Should expect to see after it'll go up as well, which does what to stroke volume? Decreases it, right? So we can keep these relationships in mind. Um, the other thing you're going to find is that angiotensin 2 also has some big effects in doing things like increasing aldosterone release, which you already mentioned helps to increase blood volume. And what do you think it does to blood pressure? It increases that as well. And then because blood volume is going up, what do you think it does to our, um, our pre uh, preload? That increases as well, right? So you can already see how this drug, uh, this, this hormone here, angiotensin 2, is increasing both preload and afterload via different mechanisms here, okay? Also going to be releasing arginine vasopressin, which is going to ADH, and that again is going to cause some vasoconstriction and water retention. So it's easy to see someone who has this system really ramped up. There are going to be people who have, uh, you know, fairly significant hypertension. This is going to be a main target when you're dealing with antihypertensives, how you're going to be uh, trying to, to fix that problem. So again, low blood pressure or low blood flow to the kidneys. And again, what, what are some situations where I may have like low blood flow to the kidneys? So low, low blood volume for one, right? So say for instance, I was bleeding uh, quite profusely. And again, when you're, yeah, so if you have say, uh, um, you know, cardiovascular shock or you have something where you're not um, having good blood volume, um, again, where does the body want to send blood to preferentially? What two organs? The brain and the heart, right? So again, as long as we're keeping those two perfused, we can keep people alive essentially, right? Again, the kidneys may take a hit, um, but they take a little bit of a backseat. And I'll kind of show you some examples of that a little bit later on. Um, but okay, so imagine my blood volume was really depleted either due to dehydration, say I've been vomiting, having a lot of diarrhea, or say I've been uh, in an accident, and I have a lot of bleeding occurring. Um, you're going to find the heart is going to try, or the blood vessels are going to try to send blood to the heart and the head. And so this is a case where you may find that the kidneys are going to be saying, hey, there's not enough volume here, not enough pressure here. Let's go ahead and increase renal release, okay? Other cases where you may find um, for instance, you know, those are kind of the two main ones you're going to see there, but um, if you have any time you have like kind of leaky capillaries, like if someone's like really, really inflamed due to like infection, uh, sometimes you're going to find the blood volume will, will then, uh, what I call third space, where it kind of goes out of the vessels. That could be another case where the uh, kidneys are going to detect kind of low pressure. That could be another case where you have renin increase and release. But anyway, what you, uh, basically low blood pressure or low blood flow to the kidneys increases renin release. That's going to cause angiotensinogen to convert over to angiotensin 1. And then we have the ACE enzyme is going to convert this over to angiotensin 2, okay? Again, that's going to stimulate both aldosterone to be released. It's going to increase release in ADH. 
It's also going to increase uh, vasoconstriction. Angiotensin II is a pretty strong vasoconstrictor in and of itself. Okay. So all these things are going to lead to increase in blood pressure. And then that should feed back. So as you increase that blood pressure, blood flow to the kidney should do what? Okay. Should increase, right? Because you know, that's the, main, the whole main point there. That's what was detecting the low pressure in the first place. As the uh, blood pressure goes up, blood flow to the kidney should increase, and that's going to then cause um, uh, this to feed back, and then it should shut down the <coughs> renal release at that point, right? Or should start to inhibit it to some degree, okay? So that's the main negative feedback that we're going to see with that renal angiotensin aldosterone system, essentially. Okay. And again, um, we mentioned vasoconstriction is a very potent vasoconstrictor. So again, you should see increases in peripheral resistance there, so increase in, in the afterload. Uh, it's going to stimulate the, the thirst center as well, and then that um, aldosterone release is going to be the other big player there. Again, um, and when you're looking at, say, for instance, we're looking at medical management of hypertension, there's several places that can actually target this. So for instance, I can do things like maybe block the effects of renin. So if I were to have like a renin blocker, that could then shut the whole system down essentially, right? That's one way we could do it. We could potentially do things like prevent this enzyme from working in the first place. If I were to put an inhibitor of the ACE enzyme, so an ACE inhibitor, which I'm sure you may, may have heard of, um, that can also shut down the system. This is probably the main way we actually do this to help manage hypertension. Other things I can do, I give an aldosterone antagonist. I can give something that blocks the effect of <coughs> aldosterone. You see all these steps we could try to um, interrupt in order to try to get the blood pressure back down. So you can see how this is having a negative effect on blood pressure should help our hypertensive patients get down to a normal pressure, okay? Because again, I mentioned over time, you're going to find that as patients uh, develop hypertension, notice that those, those pressure receptors, baroreceptors, they kind of reset themselves over time to where they think, okay, well, maybe 140 over 90 is my new normal. Maybe 160 over 100 is just normal for me now. And in those cases, um, when you start to interrupt the system, say for instance, I were to try to drop their blood pressure, what's the system going to do in this case? going to fight back against that because again we're thinking it's thinking we're trying to mess up a homeostasis so it's going to increase renal release it's going to increase aldosterone it's going to increase angiotensin 2 being formed so again uh, when you're dealing with hypertensive patients you're going to find that um, as their set point gets uh, changed you need to bring that back down over time and so again you're going to be combating this with, with several different steps in the process as we'll see so again um, another kind of good picture showing you um, kind of the various steps here so again the kidneys are going to be releasing renin uh, Angiotensinogen actually is coming from the liver in these cases there, and you'll notice that the ACE enzyme actually comes from the lungs. Again, that's not quite so important to know for our purposes. The main thing I want you to know is that the kidneys, due to detecting low blood volume or low uh, low flow, are, is going to be releasing renin. That's one of the big things I want you to know there. Um, ACE enzyme though is going to convert eventually angiotensin one to two, and then this is the main kind of like this is the 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 main mover and shaker as far as the renin angiotensin system goes. Is the main thing we're going to be targeting with a lot of our medical management of, of hypertension. Um, so again, this can not only increase um, you know, aldosterone release is going to be increasing vasoconstriction, but the sympathetic nervous system tends to uptick when you have uh, angiotensin II affecting this. Um, you're going to find ADH being released, as I mentioned, um, and overall, you're just going to find that the patient becomes more hypertensive because, again, it wants to send more blood flow to the kidneys, and once it detects that, then the ring uh, is going to be shut down, and then eventually you're going to have less angiotensin II. Okay. Makes sense? Again, water and salt uh, reabsorption is occurring here. Increase in vasoconstriction, those are the main uh, things we're going to be seeing when you have increased angiotensin II being expressed. Okay. And then we mentioned um, regulation of atrial natriuretic peptide. This should be sort of an antagonistic sort of effect here, where again, if I'm having increased blood volume to the atria, I should be releasing atrial natriuretic peptide um, uh, because again, it's detecting too much stretch, it's detecting too much volume there. It'll have a negative effect where it actually can go and inhibit uh, renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. So again, this is all trying to help to maintain the natural homeostasis here. This is part of that negative feedback loop as well, where it can actually, once it detects too much stretch, be released in order to try to tamp down the renin effects there, you can see. All right, and again, just another picture kind of showing the negative feedback loop here. We have increased venous return. Um, we're going to, call it to cause an increased stretch of the left atrium, and it's going to cause the brain to uh, increase, uh, decrease, I'm sorry, uh, ADH uh, release at that point. Also, increased AMP is going to be feeding into and trying to antagonize the effects of aldosterone. Uh, that should increase urine volume, right? Uh, and then I should see decreased blood volume, and then that should go back and, and, and decrease the stretch receptors being activated in the atria. Okay. Everyone with me so far? So again, it's complicated, but again, if I ask a, a test question, I'm like, okay, a patient has an increased amount of renin being released. What effects do you think it's going to have on these various factors? It may have, you know, um, for instance, you know, in diastolic volume is, you know, increased, decreased or the same, or I may do things like stroke volume, increased, decreased or the same. So kind of think through these, uh, these loops here and kind of get an idea for, okay, what, what's changing here? What, what effects can I expect to see based on uh, one of these variables changing? Okay. 
and we'll do some we'll do some uh, review questions to kind of make it a little bit more clear uh, for before the test. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and do a ten minute break now. We'll come back and uh, finish up the section. All right. Uh, any questions from the first half? I had, uh, actually, two people had the same question, essentially, um, so I want to make sure this point is, is clear. Um, so when you're dealing with things like the renin-angiotensin system, and you think, okay, well, renin produces angiotensin 2, which is vasoconstrictive, right? So that increases my afterload. What does that do to stroke volume? should decrease it, right? So you're like, okay, why would I want a negative cardiac output in those cases when I'm trying to, like, you know, increase blood flow to places like the kidneys, right? You have to remember you're also increasing things like in diastolic volume as well when you're doing, uh, when you're increasing angiotensin release. Because the thing is, angiotensin 2 does what to aldosterone? Increases it, does what to ADH? Increases it, what does that do to blood volume? It increases, right? So blood volume goes up, we know that increases in diastolic volume, we know that's going to be increasing our preload. So you're going to see that even though I've increased the afterload, I'm also increasing the preload as well, right? So again, Ideally, stroke volume really shouldn't change that much overall. However, the heart's just having to work harder in order to get that same stroke volume out, essentially, right? Because, again, it has to pump harder in order to get that increased volume out to, to you know, kind of go against that pressure that we've now increased. Um, so, again, that works for a period of time. Like, people can handle that for a period of years. But if you imagine people living with that for 10, 20, 30 years, what do you think happens to the heart after a while? It's going to kind of wear out after a while, right? It's going to hypertrophy. It's going to get stiffer. You're going to have that left ventricular uh, hypertrophy that happens there. It's like, again, that's where you can see the kind of manifestation of CHF start to develop as the heart becomes less and less efficient at dealing with that increase in that renin and angiotensin and aldosterone and all those sort of influences there. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the stroke volume decreases or stays the same? It will probably end up staying roughly the same because, again, when you see the increase, um, any decreases in stroke volume that occur due to the increase in afterload should be offset by the increase in diastolic volume in that Frank Starling mechanism where you saw the stroke volume goes up as your diastolic volume goes up as well, right? So, again, ideally, you'd expect to see some sort of balance there, even though the heart's having to work harder to overcome that, that pressure, right? Anywho, um, so again, looking at sort of the, the diagram of systemic and, and pulmonary circulation here, um, again, we kind of know uh, probably the majority of kind of where these things are breaking down, but the, the thing I want you to know here is that we can modify kind of where blood's being sent based on kind of what's going on. So for instance, like after you eat a big meal, where do you want to send a lot of blood to? I want to send to the stomach, right? Because you need to rest and digest, right? So where your parasympathetic nervous system is going to be kicking in. Versus if I need to run a marathon, where do I want to send blood to? Then the muscles, that's a good place. Also to the heart, you know, it's a good place. So, like, so you're going to find that you can kind of shunt the blood flow from one area to the other. And that's always why, and I always, I always wondered this, but, you know, like your mom would tell you after you ate lunch, don't jump in the pool. You're going to get cramps. You're going to throw up. Why do you think that is? Because if I... Yeah, so if I'm getting into the pool where I'm swimming and being really active, you're going to find that, well, maybe the blood flow that should have been going to the stomach to digest that ham sandwich I just ate is not going there anymore. And all of a sudden I have this undigested food just kind of hanging out and you can see some stomach cramps associated with that. So, again, little things like that. We're going to talk more about uh, some of the changes that occur here. But, again, we can change the blood flow where it's going to go to based on where we need it to, right? And so in cases where I have, say, um, you know, decreased blood pressure due to, say, illness, say, due to um, I had a, a really bad systemic infection and I'm hypotensive because of that, the body's going to try to shunt that blood to where it needs to go. So for instance, if I need, if I have a really bad infection, I'm kind of inflamed body-wide and I'm sending, uh, and I'm hypotensive, you know, my blood pressure is dropping to, you know, say 60 over 40, which we said normal is what? 120 over 80, right? So that's, you know, hypotensive. Um, it's going to want to send blood flow, as we mentioned, to the heart and the head. And a lot of these organs are going to take a secondary, or kind of take a back seat to that. So for instance, the kidneys don't get perfused as well as they should. So that can have negative effects on kidney function. You see kidney damage that happens to that. Um, the stomach, is the stomach really a high priority in that sort of situation? Not really, right? So you're going to see decreased blood flow to the stomach. And we can actually see things like, you know, stomach ulcers that develop from that sort of chronic stress um, due to the hypotension. We can see all kinds of issues that develop. So, again, this is a really important regulatory sort of thing um, we're going to be managing here. And we can kind of send blood where we need to when we when we need it, essentially. Within reason, obviously. But how do we control that is the, the main questions. And we're going to see. We also all come back to our autonomic nervous system here. So looking at the kind of the autonomic and the endocrine control of blood flow in the vessels, we're going to see that norepinephrine and acetylcholine are going to have some big effects here. So look at things like norepinephrine. What do you think norepinephrine is going to do to the blood vessels? Hmm? You say, some, some say dilate, some say constrict. Hmm. The good answer is it depends. Um, That'll oftentimes be the answer to most things in, in, in the medical world. So if you ever get like pent on rotations and someone's like, what do you think? And be like, well, it depends. And then you can kind of just BS whatever answer you want. And then hopefully you, you 
confidence is the key, though. That's really the big thing, is always <laughs> remain confident and fake it till you make it. Um, just kidding. You should always know every answer all the time, but, um, unless you're a teacher, and then you can just... Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. So norepinephrine. So again, it's going to depend. What you're mainly going to find is that when you're looking at things like the blood vessels here, um, that uh, things like norepinephrine, which we know is going to be released uh, due to like, you know, direct innervation by the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and also things like, you know, epinephrine and also some norepi being released from the adrenal glands, right? Uh, released from the, uh, the adrenal cortex there. We're going to, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, medulla there. You're going to find that that's going to have typically a vasoconstrictive sort of effect, right? And primarily it's going to be occurring through these alpha one receptors, right? This is the main thing we're going to see. There's also some alpha-2. Um, we'll talk about these in farm especially, but not, this is not really predominant here for our cases. So we're going to see that for, as far as alpha-1 receptors go, this causes vasoconstriction, uh, constriction, right? So uh, has anyone ever taken um, uh, the drug Afrin or are familiar with the drug Afrin? You take it for like a stuffy nose, right? Um, so that is a drug that actually activates these alpha-1 receptors, can actually constrict the blood vessels in the, in the, uh, in the nose in order to decrease the amount of, of fluid that's being released there, decrease that edema, and helps to decrease the stuffy nose. So again, think of alpha-1, think constriction of the blood vessels, typically, right? And again, we're going to find that depending on the tissue you're dealing with, you might not see that's always the case. You might see that the sympathetic nervous system may try to uh, increase blood flow or may try to decrease blood flow depending on the tissue. Typically, though, alpha-1 is vasoconstrictive. Okay, that's really the big takeaway there. And so um, you're going to find, especially places like the skin, the GI sphincters, the urinary sphincters, GI secretions, um, you know, and when you're thinking about a fight or flight sort of response, do you need a lot of blood flow going to the GI tract? Not typically, right? Um, I mean, you may have to change your pants afterwards, but again, it's not like you're sending a lot of blood flow to the GI tract uh, specifically for, for the purpose of digestion, right? Do you need to necessarily uh, urinate at that point? Not necessarily, right? So again, this is one of those things where typically um, when you're constricting the blood vessels, uh, going to these sort of accessory sort of organs, um, what does that do to the flow? If I'm increasing pressure, it should decrease the flow, right? Just like if I'm pinching off a hose, I shouldn't see much uh, water coming out of the hose essentially, right? So again, by constricting, you're gonna be increasing the pressure, decreasing the amount of blood flow going to those organs, okay? Um, acetylcholine, you're gonna find also can help to change, this will have a little bit more of a minor effect than you're gonna see with the, the sympathetic nervous system, but certainly uh, acetylcholine working with the muscarinic receptors can affect some blood flow. So. For instance, you can see things like vasodilation uh, that occurs here, uh, especially at the places like the skeletal muscle and also the sweat glands. Uh, you can see this in some cases. So again, typically acetylcholine will have some, some minor uh, vasodilatory sort of effects, right? So vasodilation, vasodilatory is the kind of terms I'll use uh, regarding that, okay? So when you look at, uh, say, you know, for instance, uh, the adrenal gland uh, secreting epinephrine, um, you'll also find in some cases there's gonna be beta adrenergic receptors that are uh, available on these vessels as well. Now, typically, when you're thinking beta receptors, we mentioned beta 1 and beta 2. Primarily on the heart, we mentioned beta 1, right? So beta 1 is typically going to have a, a positive effect on increasing what? Contractility and heart rate, right? Remember? So when we're activating that, we're increasing heart rate, increasing contractility primarily. Um, when you're looking at the blood vessels, typically, you're thinking about beta 2. Beta 2 typically has a vasodilatory sort of effect. So again, you have to balance that out in your mind. You think, okay, well, alpha-1 is constricting. Beta-2 is typically going to be vasodilatory. And also, I think about that within, because uh, again, this is all smooth muscle we're dealing with at this point with the vessels. I kind of think about that with like asthma, for instance, right? You think about like uh, albuterol being used as a beta-2 agonist, and you think about asthma, usually that bronco, uh, the bronchial muscle is too constricted. You want to loosen that up by using a beta-2 agonist. That's, I mean, we'll talk about that in farm later on. That's how I remember it. But beta-2 receptors typically are going to be vasodilatory, which is good because in cases like a fight-or-flight response, you do want to shunt blood flow to places like, say, for instance, the muscles uh, versus, uh, say, over to the GI tract. And so by balancing out this alpha-1 effect versus the beta-2 effect, you can kind of send blood where you need it to based on the organ and the tissue you're dealing with. Okay, So like I mentioned in the fight-or-flight response, you're typically going to be diverting blood over those skeletal muscles. So again, here's a kind of a normal vessel. Here you might see, for instance, um, you know, if you're thinking about the GI tract, you may see alpha one constriction here, uh, causing uh, increased pressure in those vessels. Versus, if I was say looking at the skeletal muscle, you may see the beta two activation uh, here, and that would actually cause vasodilation. Okay, this is just our body's way of maintaining blood flow to the areas where we need it most at any given moment. Okay. So you know, if I say beta two, you think dilation. If I say alpha one, you think Constriction, good. All right, so again, um, we'll talk about the autonomic nervous system uh, more in detail towards the last sections here. We've already kind of covered this a little bit uh, already because if you remember um, when you're talking about, say, for instance, the pupils, like what does uh, the sympathetic nervous system do to the pupils? Typically, yeah, it causes dilation or 
mydriasis, remember mydriasis is the other term for that, um, versus if I were to have, say, like parasympathetic innervation uh, being activated, that would be what? Constriction or meiosis, perfect, right? And so again, and, and depending on uh, the type of substance I'm using, you can uh, use antagonists as well to cause the opposite effect, essentially, right? So for instance, if I'm going to have like my eyes dilated, uh, at the, the optometrist's office, right? Um, there's one of two things you could either do. You could either use something like an alpha agonist, like a, a drug called phenylephrine, to cause dilation, or I could use an antagonist. So if you ever hear like atropine being used in the eyes, that is also going to cause a dilatory sort of effect because it's actually blocking the acetylcholine or uh, muscarinic receptors in the eye there. So again, think um, sympathetic though, you're thinking uh, dilation of the pupil, mydriasis, parasympathetic, you're thinking meiosis. Um, over in the heart here, as we're focusing on this now, again, typically with the uh, sympathetic effects, you're going to expect beta 1 to really increase contractility and heart rate. With the parasympathetic effects against muscarinic receptors, it should be decreasing heart rate. And again, not so much effect on, on contractility, but mainly just affecting the heart rate specifically. Okay. Now, um, and again, I'm not going to ask you super specifically in this case, uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you, okay, well, you know, um, Looking at the smooth muscle on the walls of the GI tract, what, what is beta-2 going to do? Just kind of know in general, okay, if it's a beta-2 receptor, it's probably going to cause relaxation of smooth muscle, right? So either vasodilation or it can cause, say, a relaxation of things like, you know, the gastrointestinal wall. Typically think relaxation of the smooth muscle. If it's alpha, you're typically going to be thinking constriction, right? Either the smooth muscle, whether it's surrounding the vessels, whether, wherever it's at, it's going to cause typically constriction in these cases. And again, if you think about like in a fight or flight sort of response, it kind of makes sense all these effects are going to be occurring here. And again, we said we don't need to send blood flow to areas like, you know, the urinary tract. We don't need to send a ton of blood flow over to places like the, the GI tract. We want to send blood to places like where? the skeletal muscle, right? So again, these are things you're going to just kind of be um, kind of intuitive based on kind of what you kind of know already about things like fight or flight responses. So in these cases here, um, looking at vascular smooth muscle, for instance, we're talking about, say, the skeletal vessels. Typically, you probably want to have some dilation that occurs here, right? Because I want to increase blood flow, which would be mediated through beta-2 receptors, right? On the other hand, um, you know, in these cases, you may find something like, you know, say in the gastrointestinal tract with the smooth muscle here, you know, we probably want our sphincters to be kind of tightened up, right? Because again, we don't need a lot of flow through the GI tract. In this case, you can, don't have to worry about that. So for the sphincters, I'd probably want to constrict those and that'd be mediated through alpha one, right? So again, think smooth muscle constriction, think alpha one, think smooth muscle relaxation, think beta two primarily, right? Because again, beta one, we're only really talking about that on the heart specifically, okay? Um, it'll look at things like, you know, secretions uh, that occur in the GI tract. And again, we'll get into more in, on detail on this when we actually talk about GI specifically. This is more kind of a global sort of view I'm trying to uh, illustrate to you guys. Um, you know, things like, you know, alpha 2 in this case would actually inhibit secretions versus things like, you know, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. You'd expect to increase secretions, right? Because again, you want to need to digest food and you need to uh, increase those secretions there to do so. Um, so that kind of makes sense? Right. So again, our body has a very uh, well-oiled machine and we can kind of regulate this blood flow as we need it to into various areas. Now, for instance, you can run into some big problems, as I mentioned, if you have, you know, cases where you're really kind of in this ramped up sympathetic nervous system sort of flow. Like, you know, if you're if you're have that sort of body wide infection, you're really inflamed and you're really trying to get as much blood flow to the heart and the head as you can. Um, you can find things like mesenteric ischemia, where you can actually the GI tract is so limited in its blood flow that you can cause ischemia because you're not delivering enough oxygen to it. So, again, these are issues that can happen. The kidneys can see this occur, too. Um, these are big problems that run if you're kind of uh, kind of your sympathetic nervous system is ramped up too high for too long essentially uh, so those are big problems and again here's some uh, kind of a, a table kind of showing you overall kind of what the the primary movers and shakers are going to be here regarding blood pressure uh, most of these we already talked about uh, for the most part so I don't need to belabor these points but also look at things like you know histamine when do you think histamine gets released yeah, I think about allergic responses. We'll talk about that in the next section uh, coming up. Um, and we'll see that histamine is really important for that. Typically, that's going to be vasodilatory, which makes kind of sense because if you think about like an allergic reaction, like imagine um, you have like some dermatitis on the skin, like usually it gets pretty, what kind of color does it turn? Pretty red. And why does it turn red? More blood flow, right? So again, this vasodilation is occurring there. So that makes sense. The histamine can cause vasodilation, causes things to get red, see the edema, you see that fluid buildup, and it's all due to vasodilation that happens there, right? Um, your prostaglandins, we talked about uh, briefly before. Remember that arachidonic acid pathway? You know, these can be vasodilatory or vasoconstrictive depending on, on the situation. But um, again, the ones we talked about specifically on the slides, like those are the ones you probably want to focus on primarily for these purposes here, right? So again, I'm probably not going to ask a ton of questions about, um, you know, prostaglandins in, in regards to whether they're you know, dilatory or, or constrictive, um, because we didn't really cover it that much in this section, but mainly we did cover things like, you know, uh, angiotensin two or say for instance, ADH. So those are good things to know, right? 
And so again, just another table kind of showing you uh, generally kind of what we're going to be finding here is that typically vasoconstrictive effects are going to be mediated through those alpha-1 receptors primarily. Angiotensin-2 is very vasoconstrictive. Um, ADH tends to be vasoconstrictive. Um, you have other things like, you know, thromboxane A2. This is going to be more important when we're talking about things like, um, you know, uh, platelet activation and, and whatnot. But again, if you think about, you know, when you need to activate platelets, you're also doing things like, you know, uh, trying to limit blood flow to wherever the injury is. You know, that makes sense. It would be vasoconstrictive in those cases, right? Um, on the dilation side, typically beta adrenergic effects, mainly beta 2, as I mentioned here. Um, usually cholinergic receptors tend to be more on the vasodilatory sort of side. You know, parasympathetic nerves kind of go along with that. Um, histamines. Uh, bradykinin, it's not something I'm going to talk about a lot here, but it is also um, something that is mediated through the angiotensin system. But just know it tends to be more vasodilatory. Um, not not going to be a big player clinically in a lot of cases, but... And then another one called prostacyclin or PGI2 um, tends to be more vasodilatory as well. So, again, kind of just a summary of kind of what things tend to be vasoconstrictor versus vasodilatory. Okay, so again, looking at blood flow to the heart and the skeletal muscles, we kind of cover this a little bit. We'll look at some more specific examples. Um, you know, now how do we regulate coronary blood flow, right? So, imagine if you're in a fight or flight sort of state here, do you think you want to constrict these vessels or dilate them? Probably dilate, right? Because again, if you're uh, in a fight or flight state, I'm um, increasing my sympathetic nervous system. I'm probably activating what receptors in the heart? Beta one, right? Beta one's on the heart. Beta one's on the heart. It's the main thing driving increasing contractility and heart rate, right? And when I increase in contractility and heart rate, what do you think that does to oxygen demand by the heart? Increases, right? So then if I want to get more oxygen rich blood to the heart, what do I need to do? You dilate these vessels here, right? This is really important. You dilate these in order to get more oxygen-rich blood flow to the heart because, again, this is probably one of the most important organs to get blood flow to, right? Because if you don't, then what happens? You get an MI and then you die. And we typically don't want that to occur, right? Usually death is not our, our end goal here for most, most patients. Really annoying, but just kidding. Um, now, one way we can regulate blood flow to the coronary vessels, and this kind of makes sense if you're familiar with what you would take in the case of uh, you know, decrease coronary blood flow, but um, basically we want to activate that nitric oxide pathway. You guys remember we talked about this briefly uh, somewhere else. I'm not remembering, probably farm, uh, but nitric oxide pathway is very important for here, and this actually promotes vasodilation. Remember our friend cyclic GMP, cyclic guanosine monophosphate? Typically, this tends to have a more vasodilatory sort of role. It actually relaxes smooth muscle, and so in these cases there, um, you can find that by increasing nitric oxide synthase, you increase the amount of nitric oxide being produced, and this will then increase the cycle of GMP. That tends to have a vasodilatory sort of effect, especially on the coronary vessels, right? That makes sense because, again, when you have uh, chest pain, what do you normally take? Nitric. Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin actually can turn into nitric oxide, and that increases the blood flow to the heart, and that helps to deal with the chest pain, right? Because that angina is basically a symptom of what? Ischemia, right? We're decreasing the oxygen <laughs> delivery to the heart, right? So again, that is what we're trying to uh, correct with this, and we can basically do it by giving that precursor, by giving that nitric oxide to increase cycle of GMP, right? So again, these are things you need to um, uh, consider. This is a very important pathway, especially when you're talking about uh, myocardial oxygen uh, delivery. And again, looking at circulatory changes um, during, say, exercise. So again, here we have like, extra heavy exercise occurring in the heart versus rest here. Um, you can kind of see where all the, the percentages of where the blood's being sent to, uh, depending on kind of what your, your needs are, right? So for instance, if you're at rest, you notice here that, you know, a decent amount of blood's going basically to all, all the, um, you know, the GI tract, the liver, uh, kidneys get a good amount of blood flow because, again, this is a very oxygen uh, um demanding sort of organs. We'll see when we get to the renal section later on. Uh, the brain also take a, a decent amount of blood here as well. But what do you notice when you're heavy exercise? Where's most of the blood go heading to? Skeletal muscle. That makes sense, right? Because we need our muscles to, to activate. We need to deliver a lot of oxygen to them. That makes sense that we can change that blood flow, make sure they get the, the highest amount. And you can see similar things when you have someone who's like, you know, severely hypotensive. Um, you know, you'll find that, you know, the heart and the brain tend to take a higher percentage of the blood flow at that point. Um, in places like the kidneys are going to take a hit, the GI tract takes a hit, the skeletal muscle also may uh, have a limited amount of blood flow going to it. So even depending on the situation, you can find the blood flow can change pretty drastically in these cases. Okay. Um, so again, looking at, uh, you know, during exercise, what would you expect cardiac output to typically do? Probably increase, right? So again, you know, think uh, heavy exercise, think like sympathetic nervous system, probably going to increase stroke volume and also increase heart rate, right? So again, that should all increase our cardiac output, right? Okay. Um, cardiac rate, as we mentioned, probably should be increased due to due to the sympathetic activation of 
beta one receptor, right? And I'm gonna, and you're gonna think like, man, why does he keep repeating all this stuff? But again, repetition is the key to adult learning. Repetition is the key to adult learning. <laughs> uh, right, so beta one receptors typically is gonna increase heart rate. Right? So what, what do you think the, the parasympathetic nerves are doing at that point during heavy exercise? They're not really doing much, right? So you typically see the vagus nerve is gonna be inhibited in these cases, because again, acetylcholine on those muscarinic receptors would do what to the heart rate? Slow it down, and that's not what I need at this point, right? So again, um, typically we're gonna find that uh, the parasympathetic nerves, the, those vagus nerves are gonna be inhibited in that case, okay? And we mentioned, you know, stroke volume tends to be increased in these cases. Um, now, total peripheral resistance, how you would you expect this to change? So, yeah, so typically you think kind of decreasing, um, but again, it depends on where you're gonna be sending all the blood flow to. So if I'm sending it to a lot of the arterioles and the skeletal muscles, then I'm gonna have more blood flow kind of being handled there. You may see um, that the you know total peripheral resistance um, is mildly decreased, but you're not really gonna see a big decrease there overall, right? Um, and in fact, when you're actually measuring someone's blood pressure during heavy exercise, what would you expect it to look like? Probably increased, if anything, right? Because the heart's the cardiac output is going up, and so that's going to be one of those factors that helps to, to determine blood pressure. Um, so again, you can find that actually it's going to be increased, even though the total peripheral resistance is, uh, if anything, diminished a little bit. But that's mainly because that total resistance, you know, the, the muscles is now decreased because I need that extra blood flow going there essentially. Okay. So again, even though the arterial pressure probably increased a little bit because we're, we're increasing the cardiac output, etc., um, the total peripheral resistance may be a little, little bit diminished there because again, we're sending uh, shunting that blood flow over to the skeletal muscles preferentially. Make sense? Okay, um, in diastolic volume, so this uh, is unchanged in this case. Why do you think it's unchanged? So have you done anything to the blood volume? Not really in this case. So even though the cardiac output is going up significantly, what do we say about the, the veins as far as being capacitance vessels? They can hold on to a lot more blood, right? They can, you know, two thirds of your blood's probably in the venous system at any given time. Uh, so in these cases, your in-diastolic volume doesn't really change because again, we can kind of compensate for a lot of that. So again, um, also if you imagine as well, uh, when you're looking at the, the the heart muscle when it's beating faster, you're also giving it a little bit less time to actually fill up with blood in those cases, right? So again, you don't have as much time for the uh, that natural uh, gravity to allow the blood to flow into the ventricle. The atria have less time to to contract to give uh, you know blood flow into the ventricle. So again, you see in diastolic volume not really changing a whole lot, right? Uh, in these cases, I mentioned blood flow to the heart and the muscles probably going to be increased, as we mentioned, that kind of makes sense. Um, visceral organs, probably going to be decreased, right? So again, a lot is mediated through what type of receptor would you, uh, would you think? I need decreased blood flow going to our visceral organs through alpha-1. Remember, alpha-1 tends to be vasoconstrictive, right? Versus the skeletal muscle, it's mediated through the vasodilation is mediated through beta-2. Perfect. Good, you guys are getting it. Um, blood flow to the skin, what did you imagine? Probably increase. Why would you think increase? Why, why would that matter? Sweating, right? Because sweating is important for getting rid of heat. We gotta get rid of heat, right? Because again, that byproduct of all that uh, aerobic metabolism is getting a lot of a lot of heat generated there. So we need to get rid of that. So that's where we can have a lot of sweat occurring. And blood flow to the skin helps to get rid of that heat. Uh, blood flow to the, to the brain probably is going to be unchanged in these cases. So we have this uh, process called autoregulation of the cerebral vessels. Anyone know what autoregulation really means? So auto regulation basically means that the brain wants to keep a very kind of set uh, pressure within the vessels. You don't want to have too much blood flow. You don't want to have too little blood flow in these cases. So the vessels can change their, their pressure pretty easily, independent of what's going on in the rest of the arteries and the, in the ve and veins in the body. And so it can uh, basically have unchanged blood flow going to the head because, again, you don't want that to, to change too much. Because if I had too much blood flow going to the head, what could happen? So if you ever see someone's blood pressure jump up super, super high and you overcome that autoregulation, they can potentially stroke out, right? And that's, again, not what we want to do. Um, so again, autoregulation helps to maintain the uh, brain blood activity. So even though, again, the total uh, percentage might be a little bit diminished overall, the blood, uh, brain's still getting the same amount of blood flow regardless, right? The same pressure doesn't really change. Okay. All right, so getting more specifically into blood pressure itself. Right, so again, uh, just remember when we're usually measuring blood pressure, we're measuring on which side? Well, I mean, as far as uh, venous versus arterial. Yeah, you're usually measuring the arterial side. Because again, we mentioned the veins are pretty, as far as pressure goes, 
pretty minimal for the most part, right? So again, you're not going to be really measuring, uh, especially when you think about you know, using a, a normal blood pressure cuff and, and getting blood pressure. Typically, you're looking on, on more on the arterial side, because that's the higher pressure uh, end here. And again, you can see based on, um, you know, looking at the pressures here, the sympathetic nervous system can um, have one of the biggest changes here as far as managing your, your uh, blood pressure. The venous side, it can increase in pressure, but really normally stays pretty low, especially compared to the arterial side. And that kind of makes sense based on, um, you know, it being more of those capacitance vessels, you know, it's really just, um, you know, it doesn't need to pump all that. You know, it's all deoxygenated blood anyway. It's not really all that useful to us at that point. And again, you can see if you're looking at vascular pressures, looking at um, socially like surface area uh, being illustrated here in this top graph. Here you can see your arteries and going into the capillaries and back to the veins, uh, veins here. Um, you see the pressure drops pretty precipitously, especially when you get into the capillaries. Okay, so again, mainly when we're measuring blood pressure, this is where we're going to be uh, shooting to, to measure it because um, again, this is the higher pressure system essentially. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, higher in the arteries, that kind of makes kind of sense there. Um, and you're going to find that typically the, the biggest pressure differential, so what do you think the blood pressure is the absolute highest on the arterial side? Probably the aorta, right? Because that's where all the pressure is coming from the ventricle. How about the lowest pressure on the venous side? Yeah, probably in the vena cava, right? So again, uh, heading into the right atrium, that's going to be probably the, the biggest pressure differential between those two. And that kind of makes sense when you look at like the heart, for instance, like if you look at the right side of the heart, it's usually bigger or smaller than the left side. It's a lot smaller, like it's a lot lower pressure system. It doesn't need as much muscle mass in order to um, you know, get that blood, uh, which is low pressure, you know, flowing into the lungs um, versus you know, the left side, a lot, lot bigger there. Um, again, highest pressure is going to be in the aorta, lowest pressure is going to be in the vena cava, especially the right of the right atrium, essentially. And you can kind of see in this graph here, um, looking at um, you know, your left ventricle, obviously it has the highest uh, pressure differentials here, looking at the large arteries, and then as you get into smaller arterioles and, and the capillaries, it drops off pretty significantly uh, significantly here. Um, you know, so we call these you know, resistance vessels. This is where you're gonna see the big changes as far as like alpha constriction versus beta um, to uh, dilation. You know, these are uh, where you can see the big changes there. Um, and these exchange vessels just means we're kind of exchanging, you know, the, the oxygen rich blood for oxygen um, depleted blood. And then in the uh, veins is where we have like, the more capacitance vessels, it's really just storing the blood as it kind of passively, uh, a little bit more passively flows back into the, the right atrium. Okay, uh, just another graph kind of showing a uh, similar thing here, just looking at the, these pressure differentials. Notice here how the pressure kind of jumps up a little bit at the right ventricles, because again, we are increasing that pressure to get it up into the lungs. Uh, but then as it gets uh, back down here, it's going to be, you know, pretty, uh, fairly low pressure as well as it flows back into the, uh, the left side of the heart. And so have you guys covered like how to take blood pressures? Can I tell you the first time I ever took a blood pressure? Um, I, was a, I was a young, naive pharmacy school student. I think it was my first year in, in pharmacy school. And they're like, okay, we're going to, you know, you have like a little practicums and stuff. And it's like, all right, you're going to take blood pressures. And we're in uh, downtown Jacksonville. And we had this like little clinic area where like patients would come by and we just ask them if they want their blood pressure taken. Um, and this little old lady, she, I think she was about 900, um, came in <laughs> and uh, she's like, oh, I'll let you take my blood pressure. And I said, all right, great. And so I like, you know, put on the, put on the cuff and everything. And I started to pump it up and all I was hearing. Um, and ideally, what should you be hearing when you're taking someone's blood pressure. So as you pump up the cuff, you should eventually hear it, you, know, you should hear the heartbeat, right? Essentially, or hear, hear the blood pressure um, uh, with each beat. And then you should eventually hear it stop as it gets up to a high enough pressure, right? Because as you impede that flow, you should hear nothing. And then as you start to let off that pressure, start to hear it again. And eventually you're not gonna hear any sound uh, towards the end there once you have a low enough pressure. Well, basically all I heard with this lady was this like whooshing sound of the whoosh. I was like, what in the heck is that? This does not sound like a normal blood pressure uh, that I'm uh, detecting here. And she's like, oh, that's my fistula from my dialysis. Oh. I was like, oh, thanks for the heads up on that. That I, You know, in my mind, I was like, great, she's going to die because I probably crushed this thing. And, and she's going to go into kidney failure and it's going to be on me. So much for pharmacy. It's back to, I don't know, living in my mom's place or something. Anyway, uh, that she did fine, I think. Um, <laughs> well, I never saw her again, so who's, who's to say? <laughs> Anywho, um, as I always say, those dialysis patients, uh, I think after the nuclear bombs drop, um, you'll see cockroaches left and dialysis patients. Like, for whatever reason, you cannot kill those people. But um, anyway, when you are measuring blood pressure on, say, a normal patient's arm or uh, what have you, um, you know, again, we are uh, increasing our, our blood pressure here, uh, or increasing the pressure of the cuff, essentially, and kind of what's, when you hear this, uh, the last sound, essentially, when you're kind of putting the pressure up and you kind of hear nothing, right, you're hearing no flow whatsoever, right, you've increased the pressure enough where you're impeding that arterial flow, that first sound you hear is basically what? Hmm? Yes, yeah, so blood rushing back, but that kind of signifies what? 
yeah, your systolic blood pressure, right? That's kind of the highest pressure you're going to be able to detect. So again, that's usually, you know, 120 if someone who has, uh, you know, say a normal blood pressure. And then uh, again, this is this area of like kind of turbulent flows where you can actually detect it with your, your stethoscope there. And then kind of the lowest point here is going to be what? Yeah, it's going to be that last diastolic. Uh, it's going to be the, the diastolic <laughs> blood pressure at that point is where you're going to detect that. And then you should have no flow. The artery should be pretty silent because now we have what we call laminar flow. Anyone know what laminar flow means? Kind of uninterrupted flow at that point, right? So, um, uh, you know, at this point, when you're at the pressure is at, at a, uh, the cuff is at a point um, where you're kind of impeding that blood flow to a degree. That's where you're going to call it turbulent because it's kind of being interrupted to a point. Uh, as you, because you're getting um, the aorta, you probably detect more of this kind of pulsatile flow. But as you get down, um, you know, especially like in the arm or something, those arteries are pretty well uh, have more of a kind of laminar flow. You kind of detect those kind of pressure differentials much, much less at that point there. Okay. Makes sense? You guys already covered this. So, again, it's pretty, pretty basic stuff for you guys. Right. So again, just kind of picture shown in the same thing. Again, uh, the, the first point here should be your systolic, whereas this last point that you hear should be your diastolic uh, at that point. Okay, so again, how do we modulate our blood pressure? What is the thing that is really detecting the, the pressure? Uh, basically, it's going to be our baroreceptor reflex. You guys covered this at all? Okay, so we're going to talk about it here. Basically, this is going to be the big thing that detects changes um, in blood pressure. So these baroreceptors we mentioned, I kind of alluded to this already, but it's detecting changes in pressure. Um, these are stretch receptors essentially, right? So again, if they're stretched out, they should be detecting higher or lower pressure. Higher pressure, good. And if they're not being stretched, then they should be detecting kind of lower pressure at that point. Big places you're going to see this are going to both be in the carotid sinuses and also in the aortic arch. Okay. Notice here, the um, uh, cranial nerve number nine is going to be innervating here. He's in the carotid sinus um, versus uh, actually the vagus nerve here in the aortic arch is going to be detecting, uh, basically transmitting these signals up uh, for those receptors there. Okay. And so basically what you're going to find is that you're, as you're increasing the blood pressure, that should start to stretch those receptors out to a degree. And then that will increase the amount of action potential that is going to be transmitted to those nerves, whether nerve 9 or nerve 10. Um, and basically it's going to be detecting, uh, sending up to the, these uh, carotid control centers uh, in the medulla, right? So then we're going to be detecting that, okay, hey, these pressures are too high. And then it can start to initiate some changes here, right? So we can do things like try to, if our pressure is too high, then we probably want to do what? Maybe cause some vasodilation to occur, right? Maybe that can help to decrease the pressure that they're detecting there. Versus if it's too low, maybe cause some vasoconstriction to occur, right? So again, usually through alpha one, right? Or alpha one, our friend, vasoconstrict, right? So these are things that we can uh, modify based on uh, looking at these uh, baroreceptors, communicating back up and, and uh, communicating to the blood pressure control centers here in the brain, okay? Um, also, you can find that the cardiac center, um, uh, the medulla also can help to control heart rate as well. So again, by decreasing the cardiac output, you can also have an uh, inhibitory effect on blood pressure essentially, right? So again, uh, if your contractility is going down, that pressure is going to be lower coming out as well, okay? As I mentioned, uh, falls in blood, blood pressure typically are going to increase that sympathetic um, activation and usually is going to inhibit the, the parasympathetic activation as well. So again, you're going to be a little bit more in that kind of fight or flight sort of response, getting increases in norepinephrine being released. You should see some more vasoconstriction, help get the blood pressure back up, right? So again, not only do you have these baroreceptors detecting uh, things like blood uh, blood pressure right there, like in the aorta, in the carotid sinuses, but you're also detecting things like blood flow plus of the kidneys. So you can see how these different systems kind of work together to both help to regulate the blood pressure, whether it's too high or too low. Um, you have the renal angiotensin system working through like the kidneys and whatnot. Um, you can have the baroreceptors kind of working with this. And so again, we want to keep a nice balance. However, does everyone maintain that balance? No, right. So again, you can find that those baroreceptors can, can um, kind of change over time where their new normal pressure might be much higher than what you consider to be a normal sort of blood pressure, right? All right. So again, um, say, and this is really important as well for um, especially rapid changes in blood pressure. So say, for instance, um, you know, what do you call it when someone uh, is going from like a laying position, they stand up and all of a sudden they're getting a little woozy? Orthostatic. Orthostatic. Hypotension. Why, why is that a big deal? It could be a volume. Well, who's, who, who might it be a big problem in? Elderly patients, right? So again, orthostatic hypotension is a big problem to elderly patients because again, you're going to find these responses, these these reflexes tend to be a little bit blunted in them, right? And one of the big problems you find is if you have uh, orthostatic hypotension, what can happen in the elderly? They get dizzy and then they fall, and then what happens after they fall? They can't get up, right? You guys remember? You guys are too old for that one, or too young for that one. Um, get your life alert. Sort of activate that. 
Um, but yeah, then, then they, they get a fracture basically, right? So they either break their hip or they break their leg or whatever it happens to be. And that usually has a pretty negative effect on, on morbidity and mortality at that point. So uh, we like to keep them from falling. So again, orthostatic hypotension is a big deal. Um, we'll talk about this a ton in farm uh, because again, a lot of drugs actually can worsen this in, in a lot of cases, right? So anyway, but normally what you'd expect to see these baroreceptor reflexes here. And again, this is more of an kind of an acute change that occurs. Um, so if I go from a laying position to standing, that should do what to my venous return? I see kind of a temporary kind of decrease there, right? So um, because again, as I go from uh, the laying down to standing, again, gravity is working against me at that point. Um, so you may find actually a, a kind of a, a momentary decrease in venous return. That should decrease my end diastolic volume. And I know if that end diastolic volume goes down, what should uh, my stroke volume do? Goes down as well, right? So we mentioned end diastolic volume is, is directly proportional to, to uh, stroke volume. That's going to go down. Uh, cardiac output goes down, right? So cardiac output's going down, then blood pressure should also go down, right? Because again, uh, the less pressure to, to kind of pump out of the into the aorta, um, then the baroreceptor should detect that. It should say, okay, we have lower pressure here. And so then you're going to communicate that up to the medulla. And then this is where it's going to increase sympathetic activation, but decrease parasympathetic activation. And that should see, uh, uh, specifically from the heart, what should happen to the heart rate at that point? Heart rate's going to increase. Good. And cardiac output, should increase, right? So again, um, uh, because the venous, I uh, can't directly affect that venous flow at that point. One thing I can change though, if I can't change stroke volume, I can change heart rate. Heart rate is the other variable there for cardiac output, right? Stroke volume and heart rate. If I can't do anything about the stroke volume, then I can fix the heart rate at least, right? So I can increase that with the sympathetic nervous system and try to get that blood pressure back up essentially, okay? Um, on the other side, you're gonna find you're gonna cause vasoconstriction of the arterioles and that should uh, cause an increase in total peripheral resistance, which again will increase my blood pressure as well. So you have both of these things happening uh, in tandem and that should increase blood pressure and then that is going to deactivate those baroreceptors essentially, okay? That makes sense? It's also another reason if you have someone who say, for instance, is like hypovolemic, like their blood volume is decreased, um, what do you think their heart rate normally is? Usually it's high, right? So again, uh, if you have like a dehydrated patient, usually you're going to find that um, because their stroke volume is decreased in order to overcome that and, and to correct the cardiac output, you're typically going to find that their heart rate is going to be elevated, right? So again, if you have a patient who's really dehydrated, uh, their heart rate, you know, they're tachycardic and you give them a liter of fluid, you're going to find that as you increase that stroke volume, right, you're increasing that blood pressure back up, their baroreceptor is going to deactivate and then the heart rate should come down at that point. So that's a really good thing you can monitor for patients for when you think they're dehydrated after you give them fluids, you should see the heart rate come down, which is a good sign. Okay, um, some other things we can see here, these chemoreceptors, uh, they're going to be monitoring some levels. Um, typically, these are going to be, when I say chemoreceptors, they're detecting what? Chemicals, right? So again, these aren't really baroreceptors, those, those detect pressure. This is detecting uh, chemicals here. And so this can actually cause vasodilation based on changes in things like oxygen concentrations, uh, based on carbon dioxide concentrations, and also they can detect the pH as well. Because typically, if my CO2 levels are high, pH should be what? High, low, or normal? Typically low, right? Because again, CO2 is that byproduct of, uh, we'll talk about this more in the pulmonary section in a couple of lectures from now, but basically uh, that CO2 is kind of a byproduct of anaerob uh, aerobic metabolism. Um, it can turn in uh, via carbonic anhydrase and water, it can eventually turn into um, you know, hydrogen ions. But essentially that CO2 is usually gonna be uh, indicative of more kind of an acidic sort of environment, okay? So anyway, um, and so based on that, we can do things like, you know, change blood flow uh, to different areas. Uh, we can try to either constrict arteries, we can dilate them, uh, depending on where we need to send that blood flow to. So for instance, if we start to detect, let's say, low oxygen levels, uh, what do you think it's going to want to do? Probably want to increase blood flow, right? So we want to try, especially dilate places like the brain, right? Because brain probably needs oxygen, right? Most likely, right? So uh, this is one of the things where you can modify this pretty, pretty significantly based on these chemoreceptors detecting changes in, in O2, CO2, and then also um, uh, carbon dioxide is the other big one as well. So um, now going back to the cerebral uh, circulation, this is where we talked about the auto regulation that is really important here. So for instance, um, when blood pressure falls, you're typically going to find that the cerebral vessels um, are going to automatically dilate. Why do you think that is? It wants more blood. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm the head honcho here, quite literally. Give me the blood, right? So again, it's going to dilate there. So again, this, uh, either blood pressure is falling, you'll see, see the cerebral uh, dilation that occurs there, right? Uh, when blood pressure rises, however, what do you think the cerebral vessels are going to do? They constrict, right? And why is that? Too much pressure is no good either, right? Again, if I get too much pressure, I can see fluid buildup. I can see potentially stroke. You don't want that, right? So again, um, 
which sounds kind of um, counterintuitive, but again, the brain's going to really try to regulate blood flow very, very um, within a certain set parameter there. Yes, sir. Perfect. Absolutely right. So again, when it's detected, especially if you've got like low blood volume or something, or you're like bleeding due to trauma or something like that, a lot of like your visceral vessels and things like that, or um, the vessels going to like visceral organs and things like that are going to clamp up because they're going to try to decrease the amount of blood flow going to them. And then these cerebral vessels are going to dilate, try to increase blood flow going to the brain, right? Because again, it, and that's only to a certain point, because if the blood pressure keeps dropping, even though I, I can keep dilating these vessels there, what eventually occurs? No blood flow to the brain. And then what happens? You have syncope, right? So that's how people can, can pass out, especially if they have um, you know low blood volume or they have especially orthostatic hypotension. That momentary decrease of uh, blood flow going up to the, the brain can cause you know, syncopal episodes, how they can pass out essentially. Um, that's one thing you can see there. Uh, the other thing is you, you'll find, especially with like decreased pH, uh, especially the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, um, usually due to a buildup of CO2, that actually will cause dilation of these vessels as well. Why do you think that is? Because usually I have too much CO2, that usually means that I'm uh, depleting myself of things like O2 as well. So it's one to increase blood flow so that I can get new oxygen-rich blood in, and then I can pick up all that CO2 and then get rid of that into the onto the venous side of things, right? So again, that's usually where you're detecting that if you have um, uh, the CSF is becoming more um, uh, acidic, you're going to be trying to dilate that in order to get rid of those um, get rid of that CO2 in the, on the venous side of things. Uh, other things you can find, you know, increase in pH, uh, especially with like the CSF, uh, usually due to a drop in CO2, tends to constrict the Vessels, right? Because again, you want to keep a nice balance there. You want to make sure the pH is staying roughly, um, you know, seven three five, seven four five, essentially. So uh, it's one of those things where if it detects that it's too alkaline of an environment, it'll actually constrict and prevent blood flow there in those cases, within within reason, right? Okay. Um, so again, when we talk about pulse pressure, uh, again, this is like taking a pulse here, uh, basically just measuring the heart rate. And again, when you're looking at this, pulse pressure is going to be uh, the difference between the, the blood pressure at the at systole and then also diastole, right? So again, this would be kind of the, the differential between these two. And we mentioned with your um, mean arterial pressure, again, that's just going to be basically, you know, uh, one third of your, your systolic plus two thirds of your diastolic in that case. So that's how to get a mean uh, pressure there. Um, now, pulse pressure itself, kind of this differential here, is going to be um, a reflection, basically, of stroke volume, right? So again, the higher the stroke volume I have, uh, the bigger the difference in, in those pressures I'm going to expect to see, right? Because again, the systolic will be much higher, but the diastolic should roughly stay the same for the most part in those cases. So, um, and also, if you um, want to detect the, the difference, you just subtract these two to, uh, to get the pulse pressure in this point. So if it was like 120 over 80, the pulse pressure would be what? Be 40 at that point. So again, it's just um, 120 minus 80. Okay. So again, mean arterial pressure tells you one thing. Pulse pressure basically is telling you kind of a, a sign of the stroke volume. See what the um, the difference is between the the systolic and the diastolic. It's kind of two, telling you two different things there. All right. So just a little bit about hypertension. So um, basically, we classify hypertension as a couple of different things here. So um, there's uh, guidelines that are out there, and you should always reference back to your guidelines whenever you're dealing with a particular disease state. Um, and in this case, we talk about the JNC-8. Uh, so the JNC-8, and again, you know what came before the JNC-8? There's a JNC-7. Yeah, we did use the 7 for a long time. That was what was in vogue when I was in school, and then now we have the JNC-8. So they'll update themselves every couple of years or so. Um, but you're going to find there's different uh, organizations will have different uh, recommendations as far as blood pressure goes. But this is the one that probably is followed most frequently. Um, but in these cases here, you'll see that they have different recommendations for um, what they think is a good blood pressure, right? And so we're going to see things like, you know, adults 18 to 59, they say, okay, a systolic less than 140 and a diastolic less than 90 is considered a goal. Right. So again, this is someone who's already been diagnosed with hypertension. This is the goals you want to get their blood pressure down to, for instance. Right. However, certain disease states, you may find this can change. Uh, for instance, if they have things like chronic kidney disease or if they have things like diabetes. Um, this was different previously. Um, they uh, before they used to have a little bit more strict control on some of these things. Um, but you'll find that, you know, different disease states can sometimes have their own specific recommendations. Now, if you notice here, um, you know, uh, adults greater than 60, they have actually a little bit higher tolerance here for the systolic blood pressure. And again, that's uh, in order to make sure you don't try to get too vigorous with that. Um, and if you get down too low, it can have uh, you know, more issues with things like orthostatic hypotension and falls and whatnot. But just know when you're looking at these guidelines that you need to take all factors into account with your patient, like disease states and whatnot, to figure out kind of where they fall into a goal they should be shooting for. So big things uh, we worry about with hypertension are basically going to be end organ damage. 
right? So again, we're going to find that with chronically high blood pressure, you're going to be damaging the organs over time. And so some things we can find, especially with the kidneys, the kidneys are going to take a really big hit here over time. Um, basically, you're going to find that increased pressure at the glomerulus tends to make it less effective over time. And so you can find uh, kidney disease. We're going to have things like, you know, decrease um, you know, waste elimination, decrease urine formation. Um, in these cases, you know, kidney disease itself can actually cause worsened hypertension, right? Um, so this can be a, a big problem with that. With patients with chronic kidney disease, they can't get rid of blood volume, and that's going to have a, a negative effect on blood pressure as well. Other cases where it can actually cause hypertension, usually going to be uh, things like endocrine uh, cases here, where you have things like excess catecholamines, because again, too many catecholamines are going to cause too much vasoconstriction, as we see with the alpha receptors. Um, also, things like aldosterone, increasing blood volume can also cause hypertension. So lots of different reasons uh, why this can occur. Um, and again, we were trying to try to prevent kind of this end organ damage that occurs. And you can see how some of this is kind of cyclical in the case of like the kidneys. As I have chronic hypertension, I'm going to have, be damaging the kidneys over time. But as the uh, kidneys get more damaged, they tend to cause higher blood pressure, which worsens the kidney function. And so you can see how it's kind of a sick cycle for a lot of these. Um, it can be very difficult to, to manage, especially as they become more progressive there. <clears throat> And so again, uh, most people tend to fall into the essential hypertension. Um, again, the secondary hypertension is more of like there's an actual specific disease state that's causing um, the issue here, causing the hypertension. In this case, most people tend to fall into this kind of essential hypertension. Um, and it can be kind of difficult to determine, you know, what is the actual kind of um, the most contributory sort of factor here usually is kind of a, a wide variety of things. So for instance, they have, um, you know, things like, you know, poor exercise habits or if they're eating a high salt diet, because again, high salt diet would typically do what to your blood volume? probably increase it, which would also increase your blood pressure. You can see how that would kind of work. Uh, there's probably lots of things that are, that are affecting this. Um, and again, a lot of these things are all, all going to be contributory to some degree, more so than other than in some patients, but it just depends on, on that, right? But again, would you typically expect to see, though, uh, that all these things can help lead to, you know, um, you know, more salt intake, more, more water uh, you're going to be holding on to, increased total peripheral resistance, and, and sometimes uh, you're going to have this increased sympathetic nerve activity, all of these leading to higher blood pressure, essentially. So the things we worry about are going to be the vessels being damaged over time. So again, especially with things like, you know, the kidneys. I mentioned you have kidney failure due to kind of chronically high uh, blood pressure. Uh, in the eyes, you can develop, uh, develop you know, um, uh, basically those vessels can be getting damaged over time. So you can see vision loss and blindness over time. Um, we mentioned heart failure. We kind of talked about why that is over time because, again, you're making the heart work harder than it has to. Um, heart attacks, you know, strokes, all these things can and develop. And notice it's not just the hypertension itself, but in some cases also the case of things like atherosclerosis contributing. And when I mention atherosclerosis, what is that? Yeah, basically, we're having these plaques that are developing in, in the vessels themselves. And we'll cover that in, in, in later areas. Or you might cover like in pathophys later on. Um, but again, it's basically those plaque uh, buildups there. Because again, that helps to make the vessels less pliable, makes them less uh, uh, able to have good flow through them, essentially. So lots of problems here. Um, you know, they can develop from hypertension, which is why we focus so much on it, why it's such a big deal to, to assess this with your patients. You know, almost every patient you evaluate, you're going to be checking their blood pressure and trying to uh, evaluate this, right? Um, and again, not to make this a farm class by any means, but just to give you an idea of different ways that we can try to, to attack uh, hypertension and deal with it. We've already kind of mentioned a few ways that we can do that. So for instance, um, you know, if I can deal with the renin angiotensin system, you know, if I can inhibit that by maybe inhibiting that ACE enzyme, that's one way you can and try to do that. So if you ever hear of the drug Captopril or an Alapril, uh, those are big ones we use uh, quite frequently for a lot of our patients. Um, in some cases, you may even find, depending on uh, your patient's ethnicity, they may actually have uh, some drugs that work better for them than others. So for instance, for like black patients, they typically respond better to uh, thiazide diuretics. Now, you don't have to memorize any of these drugs here um, specifically, but if I were to give an example, I may say something like, hey, this drug acts as a diuretic. What effects do you think it might have downstream um, to, to deal with hypertension? Those are things I might ask, but I, I will give you, I'll tell you specifically how the drugs are working and so you can understand the physiology of it essentially. But anyway, um, you know, other things we can do, we can try to inhibit the, the sympathetic nervous system by using things like clonidine. Um, you know, we, there's lots of different ways we can attack this, and we'll cover all of these in pharma later on. Actually, like a big uh, chunk of the, the cardio section we're going to talk about is just going to be based on, on antihypertensives. There's so many of them out there. Okay, so that concludes this section here. I think I'm um, right about on time. Any questions I can answer based on that? So you know, know how to regulate your, your blood flow, you know how to... How your uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is working. They're all good things to know. I think I'm going to go through the test today, so I'll have a better idea what's actually going to be on there. So if anyone wants to, you know, slide a, some money underneath my door. <laughs> Don't do that. I'll delete this part of the recording. Yes, sir. <laughs>
preventing the river from and so you can pee out the water. Um, so they're preventing the production of angiotensin II, which decreases the amount of aldosterone that's being uh, released, which de increases the amount of sodium I'm losing in the, in the urine. And where sodium goes, water follows it. Yeah. So again, when we talk about this in farm, we'll go into much more detail on all the different ways. You know, if I, by inhibiting this one thing, you can see all these downstream effects that occur. And then how does the body try to combat that by trying to maintain homeostasis? So it's kind of interesting. We'll, we'll run into all that. I think it's interesting, at least. You guys may or may not find it. So um, any other questions I can answer? Yes, sir. Yeah, so basically, yeah. So if you imagine, for instance, uh, I have something, again, I apologize for my drawing, but imagine I have like a myocyte right here. Um, you can see the individual receptors kind of lying on the surface. And then you would have, say, like your neuron coming in. They could then release the neurotransmitters directly onto that. Um, onto those receptors, right? So in this case here, if I had like, you know, if these were beta-1 receptors on a myocyte, I'd expect to see like increased contractility, increased heart rate um, by releasing uh, norepinephrine directly from those nerves. That makes sense. Same thing on the vessels, you know, if I was releasing norepinephrine onto the alpha-1 receptors, or in some cases you may find it just could be the blood flow, um, you know, sending things like epinephrine, nor, uh, norepi from the adrenal gland, it can interact with these receptors as well to cause changes like in, in the, uh, the vasculature, either constrict or dilate, whatever it happens to be, okay? All right, well, I'll see you guys next time then. Thanks.